Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for an update on our previous webinar on the economic impact of COVID-19. I'm Frank Gonzalez, Managing Principal of MBAF's Miami office and head of the firm's financial institutions practice. Today, Juan Del Busto will continue the conversation we began back in April and cover some updates on the current state of the economy. Short and long-term effects of this pandemic and insights on opportunities that have been created by this global crisis. For those of you that are interested in CPE credits, please make sure to answer the polling questions we'll be launching throughout the presentation. If you have any issues with viewing the questions, please send a message through the Zoom chat and our marketing department will assist you. Towards the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session in which we'll cover some of the questions that you submitted prior. We encourage you to also use the Q&A button here in Zoom to submit additional questions, which we'll cover if time permits. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Juan Del Busto, formerly served as the Regional Executive of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta's Miami branch, and is, for, is currently the CEO of Del Busto Capital Partners. As the Regional Executive of the Miami branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, he was responsible for the branch's board of directors, leading community outreach and development activities, overseeing Miami's economic and financial education programs and providing regional input into the Atlanta Fed's monetary policy process. He also currently serves as a consulting advisor to MBAS Financial Institutions Group, where he consults on banking and international banking related matters, while also sharing his extensive insight on the economic climate through, through strategic counsel, uh, ed educational presentations and one-on-one -on -one consulting activities for MBAS clients. Before we get started, or I pass it on to Juan, I believe that we have a polling question, which we're gonna put on, on the screen here for you. So polling question number one is basically, how much has COVID-19 impacted your business, if at all? Uh, a, increase in overall business, which I guess is a good thing. Uh, B, decrease of 5% or less. C, decrease of over 5% but less than 15% or D, a decrease over 15%. And we will have some other polling questions in a little bit throughout the presentation, but I guess we'll wait a couple seconds for the results that we have so far and then we'll get started with uh, Juan's presentation. As we can see, impressively, we have, uh, based on the polling so far, we have had an increase in overall business of about 26%, which is, is nice. And in terms of a uh, decrease of over 15%, we do have quite a bit, but it looks pretty much even across the board. Um, but the first one, I guess, is, is, is a good thing. Uh, okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So Juan, the floor is all yours for your presentation. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll get through some questions and answer period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank and, and Nicole, for all the help you had given me. So what I'm trying to do in this presentation is continue the story. What do I mean by that? We started the story five months ago, right pretty much at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. And back then, we had very, very little data. Uh, we had some unemployment numbers, but we didn't have concrete GDP numbers or how the businesses were performing and what was going on there. Now, we're gonna continue the story of the pandemic, but after that pandemic started, there's three other areas at least that are, are, have affected or will continue to affect our economy. Those are the fires in the West Coast. A lot of uh, people, are not employed there, they're losing their homes. So how is that gonna affect the economy? Also the hurricanes in the South, uh, how is that gonna be affecting the economy going forward? And the looting and rioting, not the protesting, but the looting and rioting has definitely affected our economy. So we need to include that in what's gonna be happening in the future. 
I also tried to do a little bit different uh, than last presentation by adding grassroots input. What I mean by that, we have a lot of numbers now that have come into the system for the last three months. And those are critical. But like during the recession in 2008, the Fed changed how they gathered information on the economy. We looked at numbers and the economy was pretty much stable month to month when we met at the board. But then once the recession hit, we needed right timely grassroots information. So we set up a new process. So we would interview, I personally, the top 50 GDP producing CEOs in my zone, the 13th of the most counties. I started talking to them sometimes once a week, sometimes every three days, depending on the industry. And that's what I tried to do here. I tried to get grassroots information from individuals in New York, New Jersey, Minneapolis, Portland, Oregon, California, uh, Texas, Orlando, Jacksonville, and all the 13 counties that affect all of us in South Florida. And, and interesting comments from some, I will keep, keep their anonymity on most of them. Some I might mention through the presentation. So as always, let me start my introductory comments. Uh, the economic environment we are experiencing is still mainly related to the pandemic, but those other areas are definitely affecting the economy. Most specifically is the policies that have been created to combat the pandemic, both positive and negative. I'm going to cover how our economy has responded since my last presentation to the group, and that was back in April 22nd. Like always, my comments are solely mine and do not represent the views of MBAF, Ocean Bank, or any other organizations that I consult with. Again, and I know some of you have mentioned it in, my, uh, in the questions, again, but I have to mention, I do not want you to interpret my political comments throughout the presentation towards one political party. I always try to be neutral as I can be to our political environment. However, those of you who know me, I will not hide my frustration with the lack of action and incompetence that has existed for years. For example, here's a good, Congress has been aware for many weeks that the unemployment payments would end July 31st. Logically, they should have started negotiations for the new stimulus immediately when the last one was implemented. However, as we all know, nothing, absolutely has happened. And it's now September 23rd. They actually went on vacation until September. Both parties have not been effective. They are back and what has changed? A CEO that commented on this during the pandemic and he commented again. And it's uh, a CEO that all of you would know in this community. He told me the problem is not that they go on vacation. The problem is that they come back. So you know what his feelings are about Congress. And I want to start covering the changes in our economy over the past five months. Let's begin with our current economic challenges. First one is GDP. As we expected, GDP dropped quickly after the pandemic. During the first quarter, it dropped to a negative 5%. During the first presentation, I commented that GDP could, we didn't have the numbers, could drop by 20 to 30%. Unfortunately, GDP dropped in the second quarter to a negative 32.9%, the lowest ever. However, third quarter GDP numbers as of September 17th is at a positive 32%, the highest ever. A significant turnaround in a relatively very short period of time. Three major reasons for this. First, the economy started slowly opening up. Secondly, some industries, and you guys responded to this in the question, have had higher demand. So they have increased during the pandemic. And the most significant of all is the stimulus money 
from all the federal programs, including the CARES Act. Now let's go to employment. As I mentioned previously, 22 million jobs were lost in, the four, in four weeks during the 2008 recession. As a reminder, it took 18 months to lose 15 million jobs. This time it took only the four weeks. However, since the unemployment rates on March, they were at 4.4. Then on April, we started really experiencing the significance of unemployment at 14.7. May, it dropped to 13.3. June, it dropped to 11.1. July to 10.2. And in August, we're at 8.4. So very positive changes in there. A lot of that, like always, is with the CARES Act money, and we'll be talking about that significantly throughout the presentation, but it has really made a change. Credit. As all of you who have heard me since I was at the Fed, I've often mentioned this, and it's one of my major concerns for years. Consumer debt hit a new record of $14.3 trillion dollars through the first three months of 2020. That's $1.6 trillion higher than the record set in the middle of the 2008 financial crisis. Incredible, first quarter. Credit card balances fell $34 billion, a drop that helped offset non-housing balance increases of $27 billion and student loans and $15 billion in auto debt. Some balances were reduced because of CARES Act funds without a doubt. The low interest rate environment have increased mortgage balances by $156 billion to $9.71 trillion. And that keeps increasing as we're going on. As I mentioned at the last presentation, 70% of our economy is consumer spending. And as you can see from the GDP growth in the third quarter that we're experiencing, consumers are definitely spending. Some of the CARES Act funds were used not only for buying goods and services, it was also used for reducing credit card debt, as well as increasing pension, personal savings. I'm all for helping individuals in the economy. I think we needed to. Food, clothing, and shelter are things that everyone needs. As we get into the deficits and all the money that we have given out to individuals, I am not one from an economic standpoint, not from a social standpoint, giving money for individuals to pay credit cards and to increase their personal savings rate. I will discuss the savings rate later in this presentation. As mentioned earlier, consumer credit has continued to increase since the last recession. I know I said credit card balances have decreased, but overall credit continues to increase. Inflation. Inflation so far is not a great concern. It's currently at half of a percent with a projection of ending the year about 0.62 of 1%. I think it's going to be higher than that. It's going to, I think it's going to be maybe three quarters to a 1%, still very manageable. Projections for 2021 is 2.24. Now, one area that has changed, the Federal Reserve last week implemented a new policy strategy for deflation, for inflation rates. The Fed is basically doing away with the 2% target that we have had for years and letting that grow to even larger numbers than the 2% before they increase rates. Increasing rates when in an inflationary environment soon followed. And it's very hard to control inflation once we let it get out of hand. This change in policy is created and it's going to be low for some periods of time. I'll get back to that later on as we get into the banking section. Even though banks have been strong 
and well capitalized, we are still seeing stresses in certain sectors and customers. And as the CARE Act funds and PPPs are exhausted and delays in opening certain sectors of our economies, banks will experience added challenges. In addition with the Fed policy changing, its internal guidelines as far as inflation, I believe rates may be lower for extended periods of time. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell said until 2023. Pretty irresponsible comment on my feeling about this. I don't think the Fed should mention any set date in time because a lot of things can happen between now and 2023. I was at the Fed under the direction of seven different chairmen, and I've never experienced anything like we're experiencing now. I think the credibility of the Fed in the last few years has dwindled from the, not everybody agreed with the Fed chairmen back then, but their respect and the confidence in the Fed was there. I think that's waning somewhat because they say one thing and quickly pivot to another area. I know they needed to pivot once the pandemic hit, but in other areas, they shouldn't do this. Why change something about inflation that has worked for years just because they're taking a political attitude? They should never take a political attitude. Also, one thing that's clear to me, a lot of institutional knowledge at the Fed has left. I've called colleagues, I've called individuals, and that knowledge that has been around forever is dwindling. They have not experienced a lot. Uh, not that the younger individuals coming in are not intelligent, but they have not experienced a lot of things through time that are critical. Also, some of the Board of Governors, I, I don't think they have the clear understanding in some of these policies that other governors have had throughout the years. Uh, again, not getting political, but President Trump was uh, putting up for vote a new board member, and that board member uh, believed in the gold standard. What the hell are we thinking going back to the gold standard? Why would we put someone in a critical position at the Board of Governors that is even mentioning that. So this is how I feel about the Fed environment uh, going forward. Now let's go over the results of fiscal and monetary policy. If you listen to one thing in my presentation and pay attention to just one thing, this is the area you should be concerned with. Because it affects our economy now, it's gonna affect it in the near future, and it's gonna be affecting it when I'm dead and gone. So, let me just tell you, this is what I consider the key to this presentation. Personal income and outlays, and listen to this carefully. Current dollar personal income increased 1.39 trillion dollars in the second quarter compared to an increase of only 193.4 billion in the first quarter. Now, how did that happen? Six times as much in the second quarter with 22 million people unemployed. You know how it happened? We gave them a lot of money through government social benefits in the CARES Act. Again, I think a lot of individuals needed unemployment payments to survive. However, a lot of money was given for other reasons. Now, the disposable income increased by $1.53 trillion, or 42% in the second quarter, compared to an increase of $157.8 billion, or only 3.9% in the first quarter. Again, where did that money come from? The CARES Act in a terrible unemployment environment. Personal savings, $4.69 trillion in the second quarter compared to $1.59 trillion in the first quarter. 
the personal savings rate, which is personal savings as a percentage of disposable income, was at 25.7% in the second quarter. Again, terrible unemployment, but increasing savings at 25.7% compared to 9.5% in the first quarter. So while we gave a lot of money or the government gave a lot of money for the stimulus to help individuals, we also paid off credit card debt. We had people spend more money maybe on things that were needed or not needed and we increased the savings rate. That is not the purpose of helping individuals in the economy. Now let's go into PPP funding. The state with the most funding is California with 66,635,549,811 dollars, supporting 10.8% of small businesses. Florida was fourth state with the most funding with 30 billion, $83,712,148, supporting 11% of more businesses. I just want to give you the top five areas that were helped nationally by PPP loans. Construction, the money was given to 13.12% was for construction. Professional, scientific, or technical, 12.65. Manufacturing, 11.96. Healthcare and social assistance, 11.65 and accommodations and food services, 8.91. The last, very last on the list was 0.30% for utilities. Now, Main Street Lending Program. A $600 billion in an unpopular program from the Federal Reserve. The Fed is looking at relaxing some additional rules to help create more interest in this program. It's geared towards companies unable to take on additional debt. It's an oxymoron, we're giving money, a lot of money to people that can't get additional debt, but the way the program is, if we can eventually understand it, it will help these individuals. It's very complicated with extensive rules and requirements. In July, the program was expanded because there was no individuals wanting this to include greater access, such as nonprofits, hospitals, insti uh, uh, educational institutions, and social service organizations. So you get the idea of the complexity of this program. There's a 74 page question and answer document. By the time you get to page 20, you forgot the first 19 pages. It's very, very complicated. And in addition to that, and I called Fed Boston, they're not clear on how this program is working. So eventually uh, we do have some, uh, there's an institution in Miami that has the most of these loans and, and it's definitely helping some individuals, but very, very complex program. Fiscal policy. Fiscal policies were implemented and performed rel relatively well during the past five months. However, they are frozen due to the lack of congressional action. The last unemployment payments from the federal government ended July 31st. Actually, this program worked so well overall that they gave individuals money whether they needed it or not. Now to monetary policy. All Federal Reserve programs that have been implemented continue to be active and working. Some programs are more popular than others. Like I said, the Main Street program is not very popular. However, some of these programs were implemented earlier during the previous recession, so they knew how it would work. The Fed acts independently and is now is a non-political organization and does not need congressional approval to implement monetary policy. Last time I mentioned the Fed may maintain rates low for many years. After changing their inflation policy, I believe, I believe this statement is even more significant today than at my last presentation. Areas that have excelled during the pandemic. Amazon, UPS, FedEx, they're all doing well because 
their shipments are through the roof. Everybody's ordering from home. I tell you what, personally in my Fitbit, I think I get 5,000 steps just from picking up my wife's packages. I pick one up, they throw it over the fence. I come inside, they throw one on the other side. So that is definitely, definitely improving. Technology, home entertainment, and social media platforms like Zoom, this is my sixth Zoom call this week, have really, really done well. Home repairs and remodeling. Lowe's, Home Depot, everybody's remodeling. Uh, here, here, one person that I called uh, was my wife's sister. My wife's family owns a hardware store, Ace Hardware Store, in the middle of downtown Hoboken, right across from the Cake Boss. So I asked her, what has happened during the pandemic? Their sales have increased by 50%. 50% in just these few months. Not only that, the prices have gone through the roof, not only there, but at Home Depot and Lowe's. They can't get materials. They can't get enough paint. They're now looking to get uh, heaters for the winter and they can't get them. So that is going through the roof. Pool companies, they have more contracts than they have time to build pools. Even non-permanent pools, the plastic pools, are getting premiums on eBay. Home furniture, particularly office furniture, everybody's setting up an office at home, and that's going through the roof. Single-family residences, another area that is going through, okay? A niece is selling a house, New Jersey also, was going to put it for sale at 895,000. Decided to list it for 950,000. Got almost a million two for the house. And this is just recently because people from New York are leaving. So that's what's happening during the positive areas. Now, two areas that I see both positive and negative is New York real estate bad for New York. People are having to make an appointment to get to their apartments in high-end buildings because social distancing in an elevator. So a lot of individuals are coming to Florida and buying properties from New York and moving down here or buying extra properties so for safety. And moving to New Jersey, the people that live in New York are moving to areas in New Jersey as a perfect example that I received there. Stock market has done, except for the last four weeks, has done relatively well. We gained almost all our money, depending on your mix, all the money back uh, from that when the pandemic started, but bad for selective stocks. Travel and tourism, uh, my wife worked for Royal for a long time. She has a tremendous amount of Royal Caribbean stock. I don't know when that will come back. So we'll talk a lot more about that uh, later on in the presentation. Areas that have suffered during the pandemic. Office space now and the future. I mentioned that during the first presentation that we thought that was going to happen, well, it's happening. People are making significant changes to work at home policies and doing away with office space, mainly in large metropolitan areas, expensive office space. This is now and the future. Deutsche Bank, for example, announced that they're not bringing anybody back to corporate till July of 2021. And we'll see if that happens. Retail space, now and future. A lot of small spaces are being uh, evacuated from uh, small businesses, but we see retail space changing in the real future. Condo market and tall buildings. I mentioned a little bit of that uh, because in New York, because of the time to get to their apartment, but also individuals don't want to be closed in with a lot of people. So 
two things are changing in that area. Restaurants and bars with high rents and no outside seating. Travel, worst of all sec sector for sure. Airlines, hotel, and cruising in particular. Gambling is another area that's down. I'm gonna help with that in November when I go to Vegas. Movie theaters. Movie theaters are opening back, but they're opening up at 50%, but their food service is dwindled. Movies do not make any money by showing a movie. They make money by selling sodas, popcorn, and all that other stuff. So that's happening. Shipping around the world has stopped. Uh, life sports, as we know, and film production. Those are areas that have suffered during the pandemic. Nicole, I think I'm gonna ask another question. Thank you, Juan. By the way, um, I got a message, a text from your wife that says, don't come home today after that a comment about the packages. So just letting you know. Our next oh. polling question is, how has the impact of COVID-19 affected your company or business workforce? Was it A, an increase in workforce, B, no impact, C, decrease in workforce of 10% or less, or D, decrease in workforce of over 10%? And we'll just give it a couple seconds and then see the results, and then we'll continue with the presentation. There we go. So I guess the number one answer is no impact so far, 55%, um, which I guess middle of the road, that's fine. And then followed by 28% on somewhat of a decrease in, in workforce, with it, which I guess is in line with what we have been seeing. Thank you everyone for the questions, uh, for answering the questions. And Juan, continue, please. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, my short-term economic concerns is consumer spending. Uh, let's start with that. Consumer spending constitutes, as I mentioned, 70% of our economy. Spending was down as much as 60% during the second quarter. However, with so much money given out during the CARES Act, such as impact payments, PPP loans, unemployment payments, both federal and state, in addition to various sectors of our economy opening up, this has created substantial increases in spending during the third quarter. Spending on goods and service, uh, uh, goods only has rebounded above pre-pandemic levels. However, outlays for services such as massages, uh, hair appointments, nail appointments are down 9.7% due to the concerns of the virus. My short-term concern is now that all the CARES Act funds are being exhausted and these are no new programs being approved spending will decrease as these funds run out. However, on the positive side, more businesses across the nation are opening and more individuals are being reemployed. As in my last presentation, I still have concerns about our tourism and transportation infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, other sectors are also falling behind and may not recover as quickly. The biggest unknown in consumer spending, as well as a lot of our economy, is of course the virus and some of these natural disasters that are going on through our country. However, since consumer spending is the major component of our economy, this is critical. Unemployment. While the unemployment rate continues to improve every month, this is still a major economic concern going forward. As the funds from the CARES Act again, run out, including PPP and unemployment payments, are depleted, numbers of individuals could be affected. However, this could be upset somewhat, again, by the opening of various sectors in our economy. Also, as some small businesses are permanently closing and stresses in the travel and tourism sector, as well as other industry, further action towards employment benefits at the federal, as well as state level will be needed. As mentioned earlier, consumer spending is the engine of our economy. Individuals need to be employed and have the necessary disposable income 
to grow our economy. Let's go into small businesses. I have ongoing concerns about the success rate of some small businesses going forward. We discussed last time the immediate need for financial support. Through PPP, they received the support and have kept many businesses afloat. However, now that those funds are being exhausted, we need to see which ones adjust to our new environment and survive. We also need to evaluate which ones have closed or will close, close in the near future. Again, my previous concerns are still relevant. Have these businesses adjusted to the new business environment? Do they have enough financial reserves to continue? Will the timing of the pandemic offset their long-term success? Now my last and most important area, particularly for us in South Florida, travel and tourism. As I mentioned five months ago, this was the last area that I believe would come back. Statistically, the statistical data confirms this. I still believe we have a ways to go in this particular sector. Cruise lines, airlines, and hotels have spent tremendous amounts of money to revitalize their infrastructure for travel in a coronavirus environment. Unfortunately, all these renovations were achieved with very little revenue. Airlines and hotels are slowly opening with limited passengers and guests. However, cruise lines have not sailed in the U.S. Their only source of revenues, other than refinance, has been to sell off numerous cruise ships and scrap others. All ships from Pullman Tour have been scrapped or will be scrapped. Pullman Tour is no luck. You're going to be a cruise line. They had great ships from Royal and Celebrity, and they're being scrapped from others. Carnival Corporation announced earlier on they're selling or scrapping 13 ships. The new total is 18 ships. Hopefully, by the beginning of the new year, cruises will begin sailing, depending, of course, on the pandemic and what country allows ships to cruise to their destination. Some significant changes are already being announced by the industry. For example, safety initiatives include sanitized and certified virus-free ships with daily fogging and continuous disinfection throughout. Pre-health screen screening before you board, enhanced health services, including larger medical teams, social distancing and no touch food handling, buffets, if they remain, will be served by staff. The coronavirus will dictate how fast this sector of our economy becomes viable. Just for an example, Carnival, Royal, and Norwegian cruise lines have lost $10.8 billion during the first half of this year. Now for my long-term economic concerns. Deficits. Deficits, I've been concerned with this for years. We all have pet peeves of the economists. Mine has been credit and deficit. At the end of 2019, the government debt to GDP in this nation was at 105.7%. At the end of the first quarter, the deficit rose to 107.7. However, with the three trillion additional dollars that we added to our deficit because of the CARES Act, our deficits are expected to grow to 120% by the end of this year. So every dollar we write, 20 cents of that, we don't have any money in the account. By the end of 2021, our deficits will be at 125%. And by the end of 2022, down, not significantly, but to 122. As I said, we continue spending money without any funds in the account. Of major economies in the world, we're second worst behind Japan. Now, Japan started doing this in the lost decade of the 90s. Well, they lost a lot of decades after that. They lost the decade of the 2000, 2010s, 2020s. So I do not see these deficits controlled seriously. And I mean this in my lifetime, in my kids' lifetime, and possibly not even in my grandchildren's lifetime. Next area is commercial office space. Five months after my presentation to this group, I have seen continuous 
deterioration in commercial office space. Many companies have adjusted to these new environment. There are eliminated high-end leases. They have also initiated productivity standards for people working from home so individuals are productive. I believe this, is, this evolution has moved quicker than expected and has become permanent in many industries. Another long-term economic concern is bankruptcies. While the CARES Act funds have helped numerous companies from filing for bankruptcy, there has been numerous companies in various industries that have filed for Chapter 11 protection. Some better known companies filing for bankruptcy are Food First, uh, the parent company to Bravo and Brio restaurants, CMX Cinemas, JW Crew, Gold's Gym, Neiman Marcus, JCPenney, Pier One Imports, Hertz, Tuesday Morning, 24 Hour Fitness, GNC, Brooks Brothers, Lord and Taylor, Steinmark, and others. Now, to be fair, some of these companies have already had issues before the pandemic. I think this just finished them off. Locally, there has been bankruptcies. Their care tax funding has delayed some of the stress that some businesses have expressed. However, now that funding has ceased, I expect numbers to continue to rise, locally as well as nationally. Another option is going to be consolidation. The pandemic will still have a major influence on how these will materialize. Now for my conclusion. At my last presentation, I mentioned that I had never given one without a conclusion. It was too early in the pandemic to have one. However, at this time, I have one, at least a partial one conclusion. I sounded like an economist on one hand, but a partial one. This pandemic still controls parts of our economy and how quickly we recovered. So far, we can see progress in various areas of our economy. We have increased GDP and employment. These have improved much quicker than I and many economists expected. A lot of this is credited to the fiscal and monetary policy initiative. Hopefully, this trend continues. While this is great progress, we have a long, long way to go. If the economy continues to open and expand, we will be recovering quicker, at least in certain sectors. However, some areas, as I had mentioned, tourism will not improve as quickly if the pandemic exists. Okay, thank you all for uh, listening to me for all this time. Uh, better outlook, I expect uh, in five months, and I realize a lot of individuals are still hurting and the future is still not clear. Uh, after this next question, I will gladly respond to some of your questions. Thank you, Juan. Uh, yeah, we have one more polling question and then we'll jump into uh, the Q&A session, which we, have a, we actually have a lot of questions. So thank you to all the participants. So the polling question, do you feel that our current government policies and procedures are addressing economic issues generated by COVID-19? And it's a easy yes or no answer. And then we'll go ahead and get started, Juan, on some of the Q&A, some of the questions, um, which are all over the place. So I'll, I'll try to put them together and see how best to, you can answer them. Okay. Just waiting on the results for the polling and then we'll get started. There you go. So no is the big answer, 66% compared to 34% and that, that appears to be expected, at least the common theme out there. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with, with some of the questions. So Juan, one of them is, I guess, a catch-all question, and you kind of alluded to it in the, your conclusion, uh, but didn't get into any specific timing, and I'm not sure if you want to or not. But the question is, how long before the economy returns to some normalcy? Well, it, it, it's going to return some, some normalcy in sector sectors quicker than others, but the pandemic is still controlling how quickly we recover overall. The pandemic and other issues in our country that we need to address, as I mentioned earlier. But it, it, it's, it, it's still, you know, New Jersey, let's take New Jersey, for example. New Jersey had COVID, they cleared, they got, got it again, and now it's going up again. 
So depending how this happens and how many things we open and how many things we close is going to determine how we, we go there. Also, uh, uh, and I have to address this, and I'm not addressing this from a social uh, perspective, but from an economic perspective. Let's take the looting and destruction that happened in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And this is one of my grassroots information. I have a friend of mine who lives there. 843 buildings were completely destroyed or uninhabited. One of those buildings uh, is, was his pharmacy, a very small pharmacy uh, owned, one owner and 11 employees. He gets his vertigo uh, medication there. Instead of going to a CVS or Walgreens, they make it for him. Minority owned, by the way, was completely destroyed. So let's look at the impact of that. The impact of that was not only the 11 people unemployed, so they need help on unemployment. They're not selling goods and services, so they're not creating revenue for the economy. And also importantly, they're not collecting taxes on those goods and services, which helps bring down deficits. So that's one business. Now, Target, uh, national company is in Minneapolis. A lot of the targets were burnt down and closed. So those are bigger businesses. So you, sub, you multiply what happened to this small business time, 843 buildings being on it. And like that, we see it in other places of the country. So those are definitely effects, not only with the pandemic, but our overall total recovery in this country. Okay, thank you, Juan. We actually have a couple of questions related to the Fed and given your experience, I figured you'd appreciate them. Uh, one is, I think we can agree that the Fed has done everything to keep the economy rolling. What other options do they have at this point to incentivize economic activity? Could they push interest rates to negative territory? Uh, do you see a scenario where the Fed is buying stocks? Okay, uh, let me take the first part uh, first. I don't think they have too many more options. One option that they should have used and they used was moving the inflation target. Uh, if something worked for this many years and we haven't had inflation, why the hell change it? That's a political move that they're not in the political arena. They should have never done that. But I don't think there's much else they can do. Uh, could they put, boy, of all our discussions, and I sat on the FOMC on our board for 24 years, deflation and negative rates are not a thing that was very positive at the Fed. Now, I've been gone seven years, and a lot of individuals have changed, but I have never heard that scenario at, at, at the Fed. And what would that mean for the regular public? It would mean if you put money in an account, you might have to pay them to keep it, hold it for you, like has happened in Europe. Does that make any sense at all? Not to me. So that's one area. And the Fed will, I, let me tell you, I'm not one who's very good at keeping to a script in uh, doing a presentation. And I used to get in trouble all the time at the Fed because I went on. Even when I used to talk about the Fed, I got in trouble from Washington. So I do not believe the Fed, I, I don't think in, in our guidelines, the Fed is even allowed to, to buy stocks. And I don't think that will happen. Thank you, Juan. Another one kind of Fed related is, do you believe the stock market is on a Fed, on a Fed induced bubble? And they comment, I think you were talking, making this prediction even before 2020. If, if you now add the COVID-induced Fed liquidity, when may you predict this bubble will burst? Well, it, it depends on the sector. I think some sectors have burst and, and are still very far down. I, I don't think it's Fed-induced uh, programs at this time. I think it's fiscal money we gave to a lot of people that did not need that money. And they're buying, you know, they're increasing their savings rate, paying off credit cards, 
I'm probably investing in the stock market. So, so uh, I, the, the market, remember, is always looking at future. Uh, and and I, I, I think if the economy continues to open up and we got a, a controlled virus, I think, I think the demand will be there for the market to increase overall, except certain sectors, certain sectors. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we talk about all these companies that are going bankrupt, but then on the other hand, we see Target had the best quarter ever. So I, I, it depends where you are in the market. Uh, okay. Um... We also have, we've gotten a, a, the same, a similar question in, in various versions regarding the real estate market. Um, so the question, I guess the main question is, what do you think the impact of COVID-19 is on real estate? And, and we've gotten comments in terms of increases in foreclosures and relief programs, you know, running, running, um, starting to run on empty and how would this affect the, the prices in terms of the market? Well, two things on the market. The markets so far, overall, pretty much around the country, uh, 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 in, 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 uh, are doing well. There are some areas that are not. New York, people want to leave New York. California, with all the fires and taxes, uh, that happened before. I think they're going to move. But but down here, so far, we have not seen uh, areas uh, in, 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 now, I'm not talking hotels. I'm talking in personal real estate that have, shown the stresses that we had in 2008. I think people are still looking for properties and some properties are, are increasing in value. So uh, too early to tell uh, exactly where that's gonna go. It depends on the industry. Shopping centers, there's a shopping center in the Midwest that closed and is building housing in a, in a shopping center. All those are being converted to, I don't know what, but they're housing. So <coughs> in that area, I, I, I think we're good. Long commercial buildings, tall buildings with office space. I think that we'll see some, uh, some glut in those areas and, and downturn, but overall uh, too early to tell. Got it. Okay, there's some, we have some questions also uh, from a political standpoint. And I know you, you, you don't like to go party to party, but I guess this is kind of more general. Um, do you foresee any major economic shifts resulting from the elections, whether it tilts towards Republicans or Democratic candidate? I, 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 they haven't done anything either party. So why the hell would that change? <laughs> so so I, I, I don't really think so. I think the economy, you know, you might put certain policies in place and change certain regulations that long term will have an effect, but from a political standpoint, you know, as, as long as people have the money to spend, I, I, I don't think there's going to be major uh, areas, at least initially, on the economy. Now, on social and other areas, that, of course that will happen, but on the economy, I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't think from a short perspective will happen. It depends if one party, either party, controls everything, that you might see some shifts quicker in certain areas. Okay, and things kind of in well, the- Well, political, man, I kind of went over that like politically, but- <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're gonna stay on the political side for one more question. Um, and it says, I know you seem to try and, and keep things non-political, which you do, but can you provide some insight as to why you believe the current administration was able to achieve such a low unemployment rate prior to COVID, uh, essentially reaching close to reaching full un, full employment. Can they do it again if given the opportunity? It can be done again, but it can be done from an economic perspective. Uh, the reason that has happened is because we have continuous growth in population in this country. We're not standing still every day every day new people reach the age of 18 and are eligible for the workforce so they demand goods and services so that's why the unemployment rate was was low because new people are coming into the workforce and they need housing they need food they need 
clothing, they need entertainment. So as the population continues to grow, we continue to expand the economy and un unemployment will be low. Perfect. Um, one question still related to the economy that was asked during the Q&A um, online is inventories at a national level have been significantly depleted. How large will the impact of rebuilding inventories be on the country's GDP in the fourth quarter of 2020 and beyond? Depending, great question. Depending where the inventories come from uh, and where, where the manufacturing is done. Some of the things from the housing industry that we talked about, some of that paint, some of those uh, heaters, where are they being built? If they're being built here, uh, it will improve our economy. If they're being shipped and China is not sending it to us because of tariffs or whatever, it'll be slower. So it depends the product and service, how that will move. So there'll have to be a balance of positive and negative on, on those areas, but, uh, but it, it all depends on the product and, and the demand. And here's an interesting question, and I know, Juan, that you like to analyze a lot of data and you put a lot of data into your presentations or, or what you cover. Um, do you have any concern for reliability and accuracy of information being given out by government, our government offices? Uh, boy. Not, not the independent Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, Fred from the Fed, I, I feel very confident of that information being accurate. The unemployment rates, uh, this is an excellent question too, by the way. Uh, I feel very confident at that information. I have never seen any, any uh, uh, errors in, in that information. Politically, I see an error every day uh, from everybody talking. Uh, and, and you know what, uh, not to get into the political side, but one area of our economy, and I just got this data 10 minutes before the presentation that is doing really well. You know what that is? Ad space for political pride. TV yes. stations, uh, radio stations, print media are killing it on ad space. We're spending more money on political ads that on any other time in our nation. Now, I haven't confirmed that, but I got that 10 minutes before. Now, why would anybody look at those ads? I don't get it, but anyway, spending a lot of tremendous amount of money in, in, in that area. So back to the question. No, from all the bureaus, I, I, I think they're very independent and they will not go away with that data. Now, if you're talking about coronavirus data or that type of data, I don't believe any of it. But on actual economic statistics, that process has been in place and I've used Bureau of Labor Statistics and a lot of these uh, for a long time and they've been very, very accurate. Thank you. I'm gonna shift. Um, we're almost out of time, but we're gonna stay another five minutes or so, if that's okay, Juan. Just Absolutely. to cover. Two, quest two more questions that are that are kind of being asked in different uh, in different ways, but I think it's it's important because it's being asked frequently. Um, so one of them has to do with financial crimes, and they're asking, what areas of financial crimes do you think are going to get the most attention during this COVID nineteen period, and then after? And could this be something like transaction laundering? Let me let me tell you point blank. Cybersecurity is, is expanding by leaps and bounds. When I left the Fed, well, first of all, when I was at the Fed, we were hacked at least 10,000 times a day. They tried. In addition to that, when I left the Fed, Manny Medina asked me to be on the board of Easy Solutions, a cybersecurity company. And I had been involved with that until I sold my shares and it was brought into Sixtera. What I see in cybersecurity in all levels is incredible. And before it was Eastern Europe, and now it's the governments. We hear about China. 
North Korea makes the other companies, countries look like they're Boy Scouts. So every area can be affected. Every area can be affected at any time. And you know, the problem is we all think it's going to happen to somebody else. If you have not been hacked, plan on being hacked because it will eventually happen. My records are the Office of Management and Budget in Washington. All presidents have their records there, all senators, all governors, uh, uh, congressmen, all fed. I have kidnap plans there. I have fingerprints for all my kids, my wife, my ex-wife. We've been hacked three times. So uh, it, it's one area that can happen at any time. Uh, it, it's it, it's not that it's now because of COVID. It, it's been ongoing and it keeps growing every single day. Okay, and we also have some general questions regarding obviously the the investment world and what's going on uh, in the markets. And the question, I guess, in general is, what do you feel uh, based on the current environment? How do you think this is going to affect? retirees and their IRAs and 401ks and what are your what are you, or some of your recommendations or what do you see boy i don't give financial advice without a doubt but but if you looked at at least diversification 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 is my line I, you know i've been one who people looked at me like i was from mars i've been investing in silver since i was 18 years old and every year i allocate x amount of dollars for silver. And now silver is going through the roof and hit 27, 28, 29. So that's just me. I diversify, diversify. But if you looked at, I looked at my 401k plan fairly, uh, to be fair, uh, not before these four weeks adjustment in the stock market. And it was up already 2.2% over pre pandemic. So, uh, it depends what you feel comfortable with in certain industries you're not you're not going to invest in but i think overall so far we're okay it depends where the economy goes from the second quarter to the third quarter and i'm sure we'll be doing one of these later on and see where it is at that time it's still too early to tell but there's a lot of cash in the system and i think if the economy grows I think companies are ready to invest and expand. And, and I'm going to piggyback. This is going to be the last question. I'm going to piggyback off what you just said in terms of being cash in the system. So we had several questions in terms of, of government assisted, obviously programs and the stimulus packages that have been out there. Uh, and the government keeps working on that and trying to, you know, Congress address, address new deals, et cetera. How long do you think these economic stimulus plans can be maintained for? or should be maintained for? Well, I, 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 we used a shotgun approach in giving out money, maybe rightfully so, on the PPP CARES Act. If we do another one, it better be very, very pinpoint targeted to the individuals that need it. Like I get, I'm looking at the Bureau of, Living, uh, of uh, Labor Statistic numbers and, you know, I could have just given a two hour presentation just on that BS. I, I'm very concerned about giving money out that is going to increase our, our deficits, which are already through the roof, for individuals that are not using these money like they were intended. And I, I'm not in for paying credit card debts for increasing personal savings. And, and, and that's not what we needed to do. And now when we increase, and I think there are people hurting, so unemployment benefits I think are needed, but they should be targeted and carefully given to the individuals that really, really need it. Oh, thank you. Um, on behalf of MBAF and all the participants, I wanna say a big thank you for taking the time to share with you your insights and your thoughts on everything that's going on, on on COVID and the economic current economic conditions. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the participants uh, for being with us this afternoon and look forward to the next one, which I'm sure we will have. Um, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you all.